Hello there, my friend. Welcome to another video here on Esoteric Circle YouTube channel. My name is Pete Haskins, and uh, I encourage you to subscribe if you haven't already, and if you're interested in more of a deeper um, connection with this online community, just give me a uh, holler on this uh, the, the messages here at the bottom of this video, and I will uh, get your email and send you an invitation to our Discord um, conversation that we've got going. We've got a nice... Nice group that meets every uh, Saturday uh, discussing Moraviev and uh, Gnosis One. So if you're interested, please uh, let me know in these comments. And it's great having you here on this channel in these very curious times that we are living. So we're going to be talking about Spinsky and some of his experiences at the beginning of World War I uh, through a new model of the universe and a little bit from Tertium Organum. Thanks for being here with me. At the introduction to a new model of the universe, he, uh, P.D. Ospinsky, rather, is coming home. And he is talking about what it's like to be on this journey, this search, the spiritual journey that he is on. This is prior to meeting Gurdjieff. And he talks about the moment when everything changed. And with what's going on in, in Ukraine and uh, the scary possibilities here, um, with very dark forces um, and very, very scary things happening that could change any time. Um, I related to this this morning as I'm sitting here on my day off and just, just chilling out here with you. I want to read this one section here that really has always stuck out um, in my mind, as um, one of my favorite passages that Spinsky ever wrote. And he's talking about um, what he's going to do next, where he's going on his, on his journey. And then this happens. He writes, But there came one brilliant, sunny morning, when on my way back from India, I stood on the deck of, a, of the steamer going from Madras to Colombo and rounding Ceylon from the south, this was the third time I had approached Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, during this period on every occasion from a different direction. The flat shore with blue hills in the distance revealed simultaneously what could never be seen when one was there on the spot. Through my glasses I could see the toy railway going south and all at once several toy stations, which appeared to be almost side by side. The approach to Colombo stirred me. I was to know there, first, whether I should again find the man I had met before my last trip to India, and whether he would repeat the proposal he had me regarding my meeting certain yogis, and secondly, where I should go next. Should it be back to Russia, or further on to Burma, Siam, Japan, and America? Remember, this is 1914. But I was not expecting what actually met me. The first word I heard on landing was war. There began then strange muddled days. Everything was thrown into confusion. But I already felt that my search in one sense was ended. And I understood then why I had, I had all the time felt that it was necessary to hurry. A new cycle was beginning, and it was at, as yet impossible to say what it would be like and to what it would lead. One thing only was clear from the first, that what was possible yesterday became impossible today. All the mud was rising from the bottom of life. All the cards became mixed. All the threads were broken. There remained only what I had established for myself. Nobody could take that from me. And it alone could lead me further. I got out uh, Tertium Organum, which is, uh, was written before the new model of the universe. And uh, it's, it's thick. It's wonderful reading. 
Um, but I can spend an entire day on a page. <laughs> it is just wonderful. This is uh, some readings that remind me a lot of um, the, the journey, the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell um, talks about in that, especially that interview um, with Bill Moyers. And that interview with Bill Moyers um, really changed my life. Um, it, it made me realize that Jesus was in a broader company and that I was actually included in that company and that we are all on this journey within ourselves. And the outer church is there, but really what's going on is that outer church is pointing toward this inner psychological direction. And when we take these steps inward, as he talks about here in the 20, I think the 21st, 23rd, was the 21st chapter of Tertium Organum is what I'm referring to. He really goes into detail about what this journey is like. And I wanted to bring you this little reading and just some talking about it over a cup of coffee, my friend. And just really talk uh, about where you're at and where we are all at and how we need to continue to be grounded in the reality of our inner world and how we need to continue to make sense of that by moving forward with our journey and not allowing Vladimir Putin or anything that's going on around us to prevent us from that progress. There's this one passage here. He starts... The world is one, only the ways of knowing it are different, and with imperfect methods of knowledge it is impossible to penetrate into that which is accessible to perfect methods only. All attempts to penetrate mentally into that higher noumenal world, or world of causes, by means of the logic of the phenomenal world, if they did not fail altogether, or did not lead to castles in the air, gave only one result. In becoming conscious of a new order of things, a man lost the sense of the reality of the old order. The visible world began to seem to him fantastic and unreal. Everything all about him was disappearing, was vanishing like smoke, leaving a dreadful feeling of illusion. In everything he felt the abyss of infinity, and everything was plunging into the abyss. The sense of the infinite is the first and most terrible trial before initiation. Nothing exists. A little miserable soul feels itself suspended in an infinite void. Then even this void disappears. Nothing exists. There is only infinity, a constant and continuous division and dissolution of everything. The mystical liter literature of all peoples abounds in references to this sensation of darkness and emptiness. Such was that mysterious deity of the ancient Egyptians, about which there exists a story in the Orpheus myth, in which it is described as, quote, thrice unknown darkness in contemplation of which all knowledge is resolved into ignorance, end quote. This means that man must have felt horror transcending all limits as he approached the world of causes with the knowledge of the world of phenomena only, his instrument of logic having proved useless because all the new eluded him in the new as yet he sensed chaos only. The old had disappeared, gone away, and become unreal. Horror and regret for the loss of the old mingled with the horror of the new, unknown and terrible by its infinitude. As we see the old world trying to hold on all around us, because this conflict in Ukraine is all about the old order. As we see this, we must put 
our lives and our spiritual lives in perspective. This is a long journey and we need one another. And as we approach these signposts um, with people, odd people sometimes standing at the direction like this guy for me, Charles Ashton, telling me when I was daydreaming in his, his church history class that I was wasting my life daydreaming. And since then, I've been pursuing this awakening. And I have a feeling that that's what you're pursuing as well, pursuing a journey of awakening. And one of the things that happens to us when we get there is these old ways are disappearing and nothing is real. And we hold on and we grab on to things that we can hold on to, common things, uh, patriotism, jobs, our name, our, <laughs> our family name, our lineage, our personal history, the past successes that we have, gambling, sex addiction, um, alcohol addiction, drugs, vaping, all of these things we try to fill. And what we need to do is we need to embrace the fact that when we are on this journey, the thing to do is to embrace this unknown. Ospinsky goes on to write, A man on the threshold of a new world experiences literally the same thing. He has heard celestial harmonies, and the wearisome songs of earth touch him no longer nor do they move him. Or if they touch and move him, it is because they re remind him of celestial harmonies, of the inaccessible of the unknown. He has experienced the sensation of an unusual expansion of consciousness. When everything was clear to him for a moment, and he cannot reconcile himself to the sluggish earthly work of the brain. These moments of the sensation of infinity are accompanied by unusual emotions. In theosophical literature and in books of occultism, it is often asserted that on entering into the astral world, man begins to see new colors, colors which are not in the solar spectrum. In this symbolism of the new colors of the astral sphere is conveyed the idea of those new emotions which man begins to feel along with the sensation of the expansion of consciousness, of the sea pouring into the drop. This is the strange bliss of which mystics speak, the heavenly light which saints see the new sensations experienced by poets. Even conversational psychology identifies ecstasy with entirely unusual sensations, inaccessible and unknown to man in the life of every day. This is some of the stuff that, that I have experienced that Joseph Campbell talked about in terms of the bliss that we all should participate in when we find that we are in harmony with our purpose and our meaning on this earth and how just like shamans we have to transcend these bonds and when we break these bonds when we break these bonds we begin to evolve as Tyar would say and we begin to evolve spiritually and when these things happen, then we begin to participate in this element of Christique that is within us, the Logos. And we begin to shed the triviality of our personalities and the truth, our truth that is within us begins to awaken to this world. And God begins to speak through us. But it's not until we have an honest appraisal of who we are 
And that's what he talks about here next. He goes on to make reference to the Beatitudes here. And I want to read this. This is just one of the best explanations of blessed are the poor in spirit. Generally speaking, the sensation of light, of life, of consciousness penetrating all of happiness gives a new world. But the same world to the unprepared mind will give the sensation of infinite darkness and horror. In this case, the sensation of horror will arise from the loss of everything real, from the disappearance of this world. In order not to experience the horror of the new world, it is necessary to know it beforehand, either emotionally, by faith or love, or intellectually, by reason. And in order not to experience horror from the loss of the old world, it is necessary to have renounced it voluntarily, either through faith or reason. One must renounce all the beautiful, bright world in which we are living. One must admit that it is ghostly, phantasmal, unreal, deceitful, illusory, myopic, he says. One must reconcile oneself to this unreality. Not to be afraid of it, but to rejoice at it. One must give up everything. One must become poor in spirit, i.e. make oneself poor by the effort of one's spirit. This most profound philosophical truth is expressed in the beautiful evangelical symbol. Quote, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. End quote. These words become clear in the sense of a renouncement of the material world only. Poor in spirit does not mean poor materially. In the world, in the worldly meaning of the word, and still less does it signify poverty of spirit. Spiritual poverty is the renouncement of matter. Such poverty is his when a man has no earth under his feet, no sky above his head. And he quotes Christ. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. This is the poverty of the man who is entirely alone. Because father, mother, other men, even the nearest here on earth, he begins to regard differently. Not as he regarded them before and renounces them because he discerns the true substances that he is striving toward. Just as renouncing the phenomenal illusions of the world, he approaches the true, the truly real. The moment of transition, he writes, that terrible moment of the loss of the old and the unfoldment of of the new has been represented in innumerable allegories in ancient literature. To make this transition easy was the purpose of the mysteries. In India, in Egypt, in Greece, special preparatory rituals existed, sometimes merely symbolical, sometimes real, which actually brought a soul to the very portals of the new world and open these portals at the moment of initiation. But no outward rituals and ceremonies could take the place of self-initiation. The great work must have been going on inside the soul and mind of man. It is my firm conviction that each of us are on this journey. And as we approach this season of Lent here in 2022 with um, uh, unusual trepidation and um, almost familiar, familiar territory with the world situation, um, 
This is a wonderful time to be alive. And I want you to know that. It is a time in which you are meant to be here and you are meant to experience this. And there is reason to have fear. But there is no reason to wish that you weren't here. There is no reason to wish that you lived in another more peaceful time. There is no reason for you to wish that this was an easier path. This path is yours. This path is mine. And we are here for a reason. At this time, at this place. And it is time to continue to push forward and realize that if you're feeling out of place, if you're feeling unusual, if you're feeling trepidation of any, any kind, that's normal. But it's no time to go back and dig up the old. Let's look for the new. Let's let the Christ guide us in this season which leads to the cross, which leads to the death of God and leads to the resurrection of God. And maybe this is exactly the time that we all need to be here as the death of God is admitted and we realize that it is happening. And maybe, just maybe, the new God is arising within us, a new spirit, a new phase of humanity, as Moraviev says, the phase of the Holy Spirit. This new day is dawning, and you're here at dusk as light fails us, but there will be a sunrise, and we will be there to see it. Blessings to you, my friend.